And I'm back with the final part of my first ever custom water cooling loop. I do have some benchmarks comparing it to a much less expensive AIO. There's a lot to go over here, so let's get into this. Now I'm going to start off with a quick recap of my experience thus far with custom water cooling. Now as I said in the previous videos, I tried to keep costs down as much as possible without going dirt cheap. So far after buying all the parts, fans, coolant, as well as a few additional things to properly clean all the components, I spent 330 Canadian dollars or around 260 USD. And what I got for that price is a soft tubing custom water cooling loop with a 240 millimeter radiator that should fit pretty nicely in a white case. So I got pretty much exactly what I wanted. Did I spend what I wanted to spend? Well, no, I wanted it for free and I didn't get it for free. Now I did pick all the parts of this custom water cooling loop myself meaning it's not a kit that someone else can actually go out and buy themselves, but I'm going to treat it as if it was a kit for the purpose of this review or just my brain starts going weird if I don't. So let's see what 260 USD got us. This freeze mod CPU block is marketed as AM4 compatible and it is, but it came with an AM3 backplate. Now I think it's AM3, it's definitely not AM4, which I guess means that the CPU block is either really old or that there's a stockpile of AM3 backplates somewhere in China that they're just trying to pawn off onto people, which I'm probably leaning more towards the latter on that one. The Amazon listing claims that it has a three millimeter red copper coal plate with micro channels, red copper meaning pure copper, and a stainless steel buckle holder I think they're referring to the fastening plate, but I'm not sure on that. Now you can see the micro channels in the block through the transparent acrylic top. However, both the top and bottom of the cold plate have been chrome plated. Now I'm not sure how much this will affect the cooling performance. It's hard to say, but it will affect the cooling performance. Moving on to the freeze mod pump and res combo. The res measures to be 10 centimeters tall with a five centimeter outer diameter and a 3.5 centimeter inner diameter. The pump is powered by Molex, but there is a PWM fan connector lead, so it is possible to control the pump's RPM. At 10% PWM, the pump's RPM is around 455. At 50% PWM, the RPM is around 2,135. At 75% PWM, the pump's RPM is around 3,020. And at 100% PWM, the pump's RPM is around 3,720. I did also take sound recordings of the pump. These recordings were taken 20 centimeters or eight inches away from the pump. First, the ambient room sound for reference. at 10%, at 50%, at 75%, and at 100%. Moving on to the radiator, and this is where things go a little weird, because at first glance this radiator looks pretty standard. There are 12 flat tubes, it has a fin per inch of 10, but in the title of the listing it says it has a copper heatsink, which isn't a lie, I guess. Now the fins on the radiator are copper, but the chamber and flat tubes or pipes are brass and the fastening plate and or brackets are stainless steel. Now brass has a lower thermal conductivity when compared to copper, brass being around 110 to 120 watts per meter Kelvin and copper being around 400 watts per meter Kelvin. So there is a substantial difference. Now water is like 0.6 watts per meter Kelvin. So I'm not sure how much this will really affect the cooling performance of the radiator. But yeah, this might end up being a future video where I compare a pure copper radiator to a cheaper radiator. Now I'll be using two up here NT12044 fans for this testing, mainly because they're white, but the performance of these fans is also quite good. 
even though they are quite loud at higher voltages. The fittings and adapters I have are brass. The fittings are nickel plated, while the three-way T stop plugs and valve are chrome plated. The tubing I went with was a simple soft tubing, but I did buy two one meter sections just to make sure that I had enough. And the coolant I ended up going with was a clear EK cryofuel. It was a concentrate that I then needed to mix with 900 milliliters of distilled water. Now the biggest issue I had with this whole setup was as far as I can tell, there is no installation instructions for the CPU block, which made it super fun to install this CPU block. Now, if you didn't catch that, that was sarcasm. So I'm gonna go over how I installed it. Now, I'm not sure if this is necessarily correct, but this is the way I installed it. Now, this CPU block is only compatible with mainstream AMD motherboards. So you got your AM2, your AM2+, Plus, your AM3, AM3+, Plus, and AM4. As I said before, this block didn't come with an AM4 backplate, so I'll be using the backplate that came with the motherboard. Now, as always, before you start, make sure you have a flat, sturdy surface. You should also have some kind of mat, preferably an anti-static mat, but in a pinch, you can always use the box that the motherboard came in. I will start by installing the CPU. Once the CPU is installed, tilt the motherboard up and align the standoffs of the backplate to the holes on the backside of the motherboard. Lie the motherboard back down, socket side up on the mat, then screw the four mounting screws into the backplate. There is going to be quite a bit of movement between the backplate and the motherboard here. Once you have all four screws in, clean off your CPU with some isopropylene alcohol, then apply your thermal compound to the CPU. Now, making sure to remove the sticker from the bottom of the cold plate. You can now align the four slits on the fastening plate to the four screws that are screwed into the back plate. Place the CPU block cold plate down onto the CPU's IHS. Again, there is going to be a fair bit of movement between the back plate, the motherboard, and the CPU block. Now place one washer and one spring over each standoff, then place one thumb cap over each spring, tightening the thumb caps in a cross diagonal pattern. I found it easiest to make sure that all the thumb caps were on the standoffs before tightening the thumb caps. These thumb caps are to be just finger tightened, so no tool is needed. And you're done. I wouldn't really recommend installing the fittings until your motherboard is in your case. If you really want to, you probably could put some stop plugs in to cover the hole so nothing gets in. Okay, moving on to how I had the loop set up for the testing. I had the out from the pump res combo leading into the in of the CPU block. From the out of the CPU block, I then had it leading into the radiator. The water will then be pushed through the radiator coming out the other side and down into the in port on the pump and res combo. Before getting into the temperature testing, if you haven't watched my CPU cooler testing methodology video, I strongly suggest you do. It's where I go over the how and what of the CPU cooler testing. I'll have a card above and I'll also have it linked down in the description. So the freeze mod water loop in the 35 dBA noise equalized 87 watt test performed pretty much as well as the Celsius S24 with a temperature of 72.1 Celsius. Then letting the fans run up to full speed had the temperature of the freeze mod water loop not really change much with a temperature of 71.7 C. Now because I'm using the up here NT12044 fans, the freeze mod water loop had a DBA of 43.3 while at full speed and only had a 0.4 Celsius difference between the 35 dBA and the full speed test. So running these fans at full speed in this test is really not worth it. Now the 35 dBA noise equalized 150 watt test, the freeze mod water loop managed to just edge out the Celsius S24 AIO with a temperature of 76.8. Then at full speed, the freeze mod water loop again managed to just edge out the Celsius S24 with a temperature of 75.1. So it seems that the Celsius S24 is faster at removing the heat from the IHS. Now I'm not sure if this is because of the pressure of the cold plate on the IHS or because the block is chrome plated and that's just limiting the heat transfer between the cold plate and the water. However, it seems that the freeze mod water loop does have slightly more heat capacity than the Celsius S24 does, although the temperatures are really close, so it's really hard to say for sure. So what do I think of custom water cooling? First off, 
it's pretty fucking expensive for the cooling performance that you get. Because the results I got were pretty much exactly what I expected them for it to be, which was to be in line with the Celsius S24. But the Celsius S24 is like 110 to 120 USD. So we're looking at pretty much twice the price for the exact same amount of cooling performance in these tests. So if you are looking for just cooling performance, you should probably go with an AIO. But if you're looking for that water cooling experience and or the look that the custom water cooling loop gives, that's a whole different story. You just need to understand that you will be paying a lot more to get that look and experience. Now there are some other downsides aside from the cost that you should know about before you decide. That primarily being maintenance. With custom water cooling loops, you need to do annual maintenance uh, that involves draining and flushing the loop. Now, depending on what coolant you use, it might end up involving disassembling the whole loop, blocks and all, and cleaning out all the gunk. There are some really horrible horror stories out there that like just make you cringe. Paul's Hardware has a really good one. Now, before I close up here, there's some things I wanted to go over. If any of you are looking to buy this block, there's a few things that you need to understand. When taking the block off the motherboard, the screws or the standoffs or whatever you want to call them can come out when you're unscrewing the thumb caps. Now this isn't a huge issue, it's just really annoying. Now what you really need to be careful about is when you're taking the CPU block off the IHS because it sticks like crazy. Now I think this is because of how smooth the cold plate is thanks to that chrome plating because I did rip out my 3900 XT and I did bend a few pins. So just be very careful if you do have this block. Well, that's all I got for this one. If you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you're still watching, maybe hit that subscribe button and the bell icon so you get notified whenever I drop a new video. Please follow me on Twitter at HFG underscore YT. I also have a Discord server. It is completely free. The link is in the description. And as always, thank you for watching and see you next time.